Hey, I do want to say thank you so much for being here today. Um, what a day it is to be in the Lord's house. This, this is what defines our faith. Today is what defines our faith. But here's what I want you to know. The same Jesus that has risen today had risen last week, had risen the week before. So let this not be anything new that we celebrate the resurrection and life of Jesus Christ because he has risen and he will always be risen. And so help us understand that, help us to remind ourselves of that. I do wanna say thank you, maybe, um, how many of you were able to attend Good Friday in Gainesville? Praise God. Um, you think, you heard B.B. say the, the phrase that we saturate the world with the good news. Good Friday, God placed on our hearts not to have church here. And we went to downtown Gainesville where we, we connected with three other churches and we were with a family of churches. And this is the beauty of it. As we stood on stage and we shared, as we stood on stage and we led worship, keep in mind this, not one time was a church's name mentioned. Because that's what we have to understand is that what we do is not to build our name but it's to lift up the one name that matters. And the beautiful part of that is when we lift up his name, the word of God says, if you lift him up, he will draw all men to himself. And praise be unto God, over 10 people Friday night gave their heart and their life to Jesus Christ. And I would venture to say, had we not been obedient and taken the gospel to them, they would not have been in a congregation on Friday night. And so I want you to hear our heart. That is what we're about. And because of your generosity, we were able to do that. I think we cooked 660 hamburgers and over 800 hot dogs. And I think there was only a handful of hamburgers left. And so that is why we're able to do is because you were open-handed with what God has given you. So we celebrate that today. Um, now we're going to go ahead and jump in. I'm not going to keep you too long. Um, but for every person in this room... We've all lost something. You've all, you know, now men, we don't use that word. We haven't lost anything. We've just misplaced it. Or we blame it on our kids. I put it right here. This is where it was, so you must have done something with it. But we've all lost something. We've all misplaced something in our lives. We can all, th you're thinking about it right now, you're going, yeah, that was this morning when I couldn't find the car keys. That was you this morning saying, oh, I can't find my Bible. I can't find my jacket because <laughs> you don't own one. <laughs> but there's nothing more frustrating than when you can't find what you're looking for. There's nothing more frustrating when you, you know you had it, but you can't find it anymore and it's gone and you can't figure out what it's, where it's gone to. And, and what we realize is the longer we look for it, the more frustrated we become. The longer we look for it, the more frustrated we become. The tension builds, the blood pressure rises, and if you're like me, we begin to sweat. And if you're like me, you know when that first time, first round, and, and, and the one thing that always goes missing in our house is the TV remote. How many of you can relate? It, it just, you know, that first time, it's really not that big of a deal. You know, you start, you'll pull back the couch cushions, you'll pull up 87 blankets that are all over the living room, but then if that's the failed attempt and you've still torn the house apart, you can't find it, your second round of looking gets a lot more aggressive. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And instead of just pulling the couch cushions now, you begin to throw them. You begin to chunk blankets against the wall. You begin yelling at everybody. And then there's always that one family member that always asks you the dreaded question. Well, where's the last place you've had it? Well, if I knew the last place I had it, I wouldn't be looking for it. That happened at our house this past week, and I'm being serious. But we all know that when we're looking for something, we get discouraged, we get frustrated, we get angry. But I think we can all look at our world. We can all look at our nation. We can all look at, at our community. And we can see that people, this concept that we're talking about is exactly why we see people acting the way they're acting. They're frustrated. They're discouraged. They're stressed out. 
And the truth is, is the reason that they are The reason that our world is in the condition it is, the reason that our nation is in the condition that it is, is they can't find what they're looking for. They can't find what they're looking for. And people are looking everywhere. They're trying everything. And what it continues to lead is it leads people to confusion. It leads people to frustration. It leads people to being anxious and being discouraged. And that's exactly what we see today when we look at the scripture. The three women that showed up to the tomb to look for the body of Jesus, the Bible says that they left perplexed. They were left perplexed, which literally means to be confused, means that they've lost their way, means they're disoriented. And that's what we're gonna look at today is is what led to these women being so perplexed. I want you to turn to the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 24, it's no surprise that this is where we'll be reading from today. We're gonna read verses one through nine and then we're just gonna kind of walk through this just very quickly this morning. But in the gospel of Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, and we're gonna read just verses one through nine. We read, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, They came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't find what they were looking for. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. Must have been a tan sports coat. (laughs) Dang, that's not even in the notes, and I brought attention to it. And the women were terrified and they bowed their faces to the ground and the men said to them, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified and on the third day rise again And they remembered his words and they returned from the tomb and they reported all of these things to the 11 and to all of the rest. You see, up to this point, we know that that Jesus had died, that Jesus had been murdered, that he'd been placed in this borrowed tomb. And these three women were taking the spices to, to anoint the body, to put it on the body of Jesus. And so when they did that, they arrived at the tomb and the stone had been rolled away. And according to the scripture, they looked in and they went in and the body was not there. They didn't find what they were looking for. And as a result of not finding what they were looking for, what we read is the very thing that we were talking about a moment ago is the Bible says that they were perplexed. And as I shared again, I'll share it now, it says that when someone's perplexed, they they lose their way. They're confused or they're lifted to a high level of anxiety. All of a sudden, these women went looking for something, stuck their head in, went into the tomb and it was not there. And that is the moment that panic set in because they couldn't find what they were looking for. But then the next word we read It says, while they were perplexed about this, behold, behold. Charles Spurgeon says this. He said, when we see the word behold in the scripture, he calls it the word of wonder. And he claims that this word perplexed, that when we see it hanging in the scripture, that we need to treat it like an ancient billboard. That it means, hey, whatever I'm about to say next, you need to pay attention. Pay attention to what I'm about to say. Pay attention to what the word of God is about to announce. But he says, behold, basically he's saying, pay attention. And then listen what the angels say. Then the two men suddenly stood there in dazzling clothes and the women were terrified and their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, why do you seek the living one? among the dead. And so when these angels announce, behold, when they say, pay attention, 
What the angels are about to unpack is the truth that is gonna let them know why they feel so perplexed. The angels are about to announce, here is the truth of why you are confused. Here's the truth of why you are anxious. Here's the truth of why you're discouraged. Here's the truth of why you are frustrated. And the truth is this, number one, you're not finding what you're looking for. You're not finding what you're looking for. And here's, what, here's why. You ready? Here's what led to their perplexity. They're looking in the wrong place. They're looking in the wrong place. And they say, why do you look for the living among the dead? Then they go on to announce that he's alive. Now, why in the world would we go to a tomb to look for something that's alive? Because something that is alive is not in a tomb. And so he says there, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Because something that is alive is not going to be in a tomb. And so this poses a question. And these two truths that we're going to unpack, number one, we've just mentioned it, that they were looking in the wrong place. But these two truths that we're gonna unpack today, I think if we look at them, we can relate this to, to our context. We can look at this and we can look through the eyes of this scripture and we can see that there's so many things in our life that lead us to being perplexed, that lead to these overwhelming emotions of perplexity. And the first time we see that we're led that way, what I want you to hear today is this. We're feeling perplexed because a lot of us are looking in the wrong place. We're looking in the wrong place. These women came looking for life. They came looking for life because as we've already heard this morning at the sunrise, the reason that they wanted to be in the presence of Jesus is because with Jesus, there was joy, there was hope, there was peace, there was courage. And they were still looking for these things. The reason that our world is in the condition that it is, is because we have a world full of people that are looking for joy, that are looking for hope, that are looking for peace, that are looking for contentment, that are looking for identity. And the bottom line is, is we are looking in the wrong place. We're looking in the wrong place. But you see, while we have a desire to have joy while he have a desire to have peace, to have contentment, to have an identity, you understand that's the heart of the father. The father wants this very thing for his children. The father wants that very thing for all of us in this room. That's the very reason that he sent his son. That is the very reason that he sent his son is so that we could have this. And we read it all throughout the scripture. The Bible says this, that he himself is our peace. That he himself is our peace. And then Jesus goes on to say, may my joy be in you. Then he tells us, don't be anxious about your life. Then he goes on to proclaim that I am the way. Then we also read in the text that we who are in Christ, we're hidden in Christ. There's our identity. But the problem is, is our world and our culture and our nation is telling us that we can find all of this elsewhere. But I'm here to tell you this morning, if you continue to look in the wrong places, you're never going to find the joy, the peace, the contentment, the identity that your heart longs for. You're not gonna find it. And where we are so similar to these women, we are going to the deepest, darkest places to find it. We're looking for life. And why are we going to darkness to look for life? You're not gonna find it, it's not there. And so no matter how many times we go back to the darkness, you're never gonna find what your heart longs for. 
in the gospel of John. Listen to what Jesus says. In John chapter four, verses 13 and 14, it says, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of this water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Stop looking in the wrong places. If we continue to look in the wrong places, you're gonna continue to be overwhelmed by emptiness. We've gotta stop looking in the wrong places. And where I want you to examine your heart today is where are you looking? Where are you looking to find joy? Where are you looking to find contentment? Where are you looking to find peace? Are you looking to your job? Are you looking to relationships? And husbands and wives, I'll even direct that to us right now. If you're looking for the peace and the joy and contentment that God places in our heart, can I tell you, your spouse is not going to feel that. This is why marriages fall apart is because we have an expectation of our spouse that only Jesus Christ can fill. So we've got to quit depending upon these earthly relationships to fill a void that only the son of God can. Are we finding it in these relationships? Are we finding it in how much money we have? Teenagers, are you finding it in your sports or your education? I wonder how many here today you're looking for it in some sort of substance. Is it a pill bottle? Is it an alcoholic bottle? What are you going to? You know, in this new thing that's going around, not new, it's been around for a while now, but we have teenagers who are looking for joy and peace and contentment at the cost of harming themselves. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find the very thing that God has placed in your heart that only he can feel. And the problem is, is we are guilty of looking. We're looking for the living among the dead. Because you realize what the world has to offer you is dead. What the world offers you leads to death. But praise be unto God, we have life in the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the angels have shared the first truth that has led to their perplexity. And that first truth is they were looking in the wrong place. But the second thing that had led to the perplexity was they had forgotten the word of God. They had forgotten the word of God. We read that in verse six and seven. He is not here. He has risen. Then the key word, remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. Remember what he said? He's already told you what was coming, verse seven, saying that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified and on the third day he would rise again. So if they remembered what the son of God had said, they should not have been perplexed, but in their carnal mind, they had forgotten what Jesus had promised them was going to happen. How often do we how often do we, as followers of Jesus Christ, how often do we become overwhelmed with being perplexed simply because we forget the promises of God? We forget the word of God. And we're led to frustration. We're led to discouragement. 
Because we forget the simple promises that God has given us. And here's some things that the word says, or how many times we say these things, and then we combat it with the word of God. How many of us in this room, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have made the statement, I am overwhelmed? I am overwhelmed, but let me tell you what the word says. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. So our flesh says one thing, the word of God says the opposite. We say things like, I can't take it anymore. And he says, I'm gonna send for you the comforter. We say things like, God, there's no way you can use me. And Jesus says, I'm gonna make you fishers of men. And you know, there's no doubt in this room this morning as there is every week. There's people in this room that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's people in this room that don't know him. There's people in this room that you've never trusted in what he had finished on the cross. And you may be saying in your mind today, well, there's no way that Jesus could accept me the way that I am. There's no way Jesus could love me because of what I'm doing. There's no way Jesus could take me in because of what I have done. Let me tell you that what's in your mind, but here's what the scripture says. The one who comes to me, I will not cast them out. I don't think you get that. That while your mind, while the enemy wants you to believe that there's no way the, 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 the Jesus Christ died for you, that there's no way that Jesus could take you in. What Jesus' word promises is he says, it doesn't matter who comes to me, I will not cast them out. You're welcomed. And the beautiful part of that message is there's no prerequisites. You don't have to have anything fixed. You don't have to have anything figured out. Because he says, it doesn't matter who comes to me. I'm not gonna cast you out. Bring all that you are. Bring everything, everything that you think you're not. Bring all of your sinful habits. Bring all of your discouragements, bring all of your frustrations, be all, bring your broken home, bring your broken marriages, bring all of those things. And he says, guess what? Because you're coming to me, I'm not gonna cast you out. Come just as you are. Come just as you are. And then when we come just as we are, what we see is what the scripture says that for all of us, we need to be reminded that when we remember the word of God, when we hear the promises of God, when we hear the voice of Jesus, it brings transformation. It brings life change. You know, this morning, if you miss sunrise, There was four women that were able to stand and proclaim, because he lives, I can do this. Because he lives, I have overcome this. And it's not my job to tell their stories. But can I tell you that every single one of them have walked through some of the darkest valleys but because of the presence of God, because he lives, they have overcome the very valleys that they were stuck in. Because they remembered the promises of God. Because they remembered the words of the Savior. And we all need to be reminded is that when we remember the words of God, when we remember the power of God's word, it brings life transformation. Look at verses eight and nine. After the angels had reminded them, look at what verse eight says. They remembered his words. And then they returned from the tomb and they reported all the things to the 11 and to all of the rest. Because they remembered the words of God, everything changed. The word changed everything. They went from being distressed 
to being determined because they had forgotten, they had become paralyzed, they were perplexed, they were overwhelmed, and now all of a sudden they went from being perplexed to being on mission. The word of God transformed everything about their demeanor. It transformed everything about they were facing because they remembered the promises of God. But what we realize is that Anytime there's the lack of truth in our life, anytime there's the lack of God's word in our life, it leads to perplexity. It leads to confusion. It leads to brokenness. And when the absence of truth is in our life, when the absence of God's word is in our life, we continue over and over and over again to turn to the wrong places to try to fill a void that only the Son of God can. We're turning everywhere but the Scripture. We're turning everywhere but the Savior. And just like we talked about in the beginning, the more you look, and the more you don't find what you're looking for, the more discouraged you come, the more frustrated you become, the more aggravated you become, and the more hard-hearted you become, and the more just you're ready just to be done. Because you're not finding what you're looking for. And the only place you're gonna find what you're looking for is in Jesus. You know, maybe you're a believer here this morning. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for 30 years, maybe 50 years, maybe two weeks. But maybe you've trusted in what he has done for you and you've been saved by the grace of God, but you're here this morning and you find yourself discouraged. You find yourself frustrated. You find yourself in that place where you're just wondering what's it worth. Maybe the only reason you're here today is to be reminded of the truth. Is to be reminded of the truth of God's word. But maybe this next note is for believers and non-believers alike. Stop looking in the wrong places. And I almost wish we could just even give some sort of response here and just wonder how many of us can say that we're just looking in the wrong places because when I tell you this, you think, well, you're, you're the pastor. You don't ever look in the wrong places. Can I tell you that I look in the wrong places every single day? That I try to fill a void that only God can do. And I try to find that void in my kids. I try to find that void in my wife. And I try to find that void in my work. I try to find that void in my job. But at the end of the day, the only place that that is going to be filled is if I crawl up in the lap of my heavenly father and I remember his promises. I remember his words. And this is on those days that I don't want to go anymore. That is the day that the wind is put in my sail. Not because I've just risen up, but because the word of God has risen up in me and this is life. And so I want you in the room, if you're a believer to be okay with saying, you know what? I've trusted Jesus, but I'm still frustrated. I'm still discouraged. Can I tell you, join the club? We all go through those seasons and it's okay. It is okay to not be okay. Because that's what a family is for. That's what the family of God is for. And in just a moment, we're gonna give a response. We're gonna give an invitation. But what I'm gonna challenge before we ever give an invitation 
for someone to step into a relationship with Jesus Christ is I'm gonna ask the believers in the room to be bold. I'm gonna ask the believers in the room to take a stand. I'm gonna ask the believers in the room to lead out front. Because I think if there's people here that don't know Jesus and they can see that we too as believers still have tough times, that we still have struggles, that we're still frustrated, then all of a sudden those non-believers are gonna go, you know what? I thought I had to have it all figured out. But I know that guy right there. That's the, that's the preacher over at that church. And he's wearing a sharp blazer. <laughs> but he's, he gets discouraged. He gets frustrated. He gets down in the dumps. Then they're gonna see you as a coworker walk up and go, well, I work with them and I, I know they go to church every week. I didn't know that they were having struggles at home. I thought because they went to church, everything was perfect. Or maybe teenagers, you're in the room and you're that poor kid that just gets drugged to church every week. And so the kids in your class, they look at you. And if you take a stand and you say, hey, you know what? I'm hurting today. I'm struggling. For that lost friend that sits beside you at school. I can promise you, God can use your brokenness to open their eyes to him. And so this morning, are we, we've got to stop looking in the wrong places. But for you as a non-believer today, if you don't know Jesus, if you never trusted Jesus, here's what I want you to say. And I, I always be careful using this terminology because it frustrates me because we always say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna go to church to try to find God. Or I'm gonna go looking for God. Can I tell you right now, this morning, God is not hiding. He's not trying to hide himself from you. Matter of fact, according to the Old Testament, he began the pursuit of you. He become chasing after you. So he's doing the last thing he's doing is hiding from you. But we have this in our mind that we've got to go to church to find God. Can I tell you? You don't have to look for God. Just open your eyes. He's right there. And if you're here this morning, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit of God is in pursuit of you right now because if he wasn't, you wouldn't be here. And that's what I love about Jesus is that even in our discouragement, even in our perplexity, he's standing right there. Look at verse 14. And they were talking with each other about all of these things which had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, listen, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Jesus approached them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. But the good news in that passage today The reason that he came out of the grave was so that we could have resurrection life, the same that was his. But the reason that he came out of that grave is so he could approach you. And there's no doubt in my mind, Jesus is approaching someone right now in this moment this morning. And because of your past, maybe because of your present, just as the ladies, you don't even recognize him. But I want you to hear my heart this morning that Jesus is approaching you. He's after you. And I want you to know that you have been, you've been prayed for. I have fasted, praying that someone would come to know the Lord today. But 
because it is so easy to come in here on Easter Sunday and just check the box. But I want you to hear this morning that Jesus is approaching you. So where are you at this morning? Are we looking in the wrong places? Or have we forgotten the word of God? It's that simple. And so what I wanna do before we even get into a moment of worship today I know some of you are probably going, well, Brian, this is very like, oh, this is, this is supposed to be like an uplifting day. Can I tell you? It is. Because my prayer has been for those who walk in dead, leave alive. The same way that Jesus went into the tomb, he went in dead. But he left alive. And that too can be yours. If you'll place your faith in the finished work of what he's done, you quit trying to do it.